Hello, so for what I wanted to talk about today, it seemed like there were two options for books. I could have gone with The Excellent Strategy by Lawrence Freeman, Strategy of History, but I decided that wouldn't make the points which I think need making. So I've gone with The Life and Letters of David Beatty, Admiral of the Fleet, by Rear Admiral W.S. Charles, who basically loved him. Now, I'm notorious a bit in naval history circles and on the internet as a bit of a David Beatty basher. I am not his biggest fan. I think he did a pretty poor job at certain points in World War One. Did a okay job in others, but a pretty poor job at certain points, and he put blame on others, which is something I never respect. And also then post well, he World War One he basically gives up the whole naval avia uh, na uh, uh, the whole naval aviation thing is just permanently given over to the RAF for the next 20 years when he had a chance to recover at least the carrier-borne component post-World War One and after the lovely April Fool's Day event of 1918. So, leaving that then, why am I talking about him? Why am I bringing his book up? Because here is the thing. We seem to have lost a lot of the debate today of the middle ground. If a leader you like speaks strong words at an event, they are being powerful, they're, being, they're representing your nation. If they seem to be sidelined, then you say they're being bullied or, uh, or unjustly treated by the other, other nations. Conversely, if you don't like them, and they speak strong words, then they're being arrogant and foolish. And if they're being ignored by the other nations, then their little boy, uh, little boy or little girl sometimes are getting their just desserts because they don't know what they're doing. All those sides are wrong. All of them are wrong. And if that is what you reduce your political discourse to, that's also what you reduce your historical discourse and your educational discourse to. I.e., whatever happens, the person you like must be seen in the best positive light, and whatever happens, the person you don't like must be seen in the worst possible light. When the reality is far more complicated. I have lots of books on David Beatty. I know him as well as I can know any person from history who I have never met. He is a complicated person. He is not one way or the other. This is a very good book to understand that complications, because once you get through Chalmers, I love him, he's amazing, there is the fact that this is the life and letters of David Beatty. There's a lot of David Beatty in his own words here. And that can reveal a lot if you prepare, if you're prepared to read it with an open mind. And that's possibly the most important thing. Learning you need an open mind for. So that is what you do. If you go into learning with your mind already made up, you won't learn anything. You will never learn anything if you go into it with your mind already made up. I am quite a good debater, I would hope. I think, from my previous experience. But, I have lost some debates. I've had my mind changed by some debates. Not always in the way which the person debating me would probably wish, because sometimes looking at hearing the information presented from the other way has sent my mind down another route as I've synthesised that information with the information I myself understand. But the thing is, it, what is important is having the open mind and listening to the debate. And that's where, again, this book is good. 
because I've talked about one side of the Jutland scandal. I've talked about all the various things which go on with the Battle of Jutland, all the various things which happen with the reports afterwards. But, until you're in the book, and you're getting what is probably as close as we can get to from BT's own perspective, or rather, someone who's going to push forward his own perspective, you know, that's important. Because you need the balance of the information. There is also the fact that there is a reason that the Battle of Jutland is divided in two. Because there is one part where you can certainly say that BT was not at his finest. I don't think there's any part of the Battle of Jutland where he really shows himself off massively, amazingly well, but in his own words. And this is the point you get. In the absence of BT's scouting forces, the Grand Fleet was screened ahead by a line of armoured cruisers of the defence class. These ships, being out of date, lacked the speed for this duty. In consequence, they never succeeded in reaching their allotted stations and were only six miles ahead of the battle fleet when the enemy was ultimately sighted. The first intimidation, uh, imita intimation that Jellicoe received that the High Seas Fleet was at sea came in the Southampton's enemy report, dispatched at 4.38pm, whereupon he informed the Admiralty and all concerned that a fleet action was imminent. From this time onwards, the Southampton continued to send a series of reports, from which the Commander-in-Chief learned the composition of the enemy fleet, that the German battlecruisers had closed their battle fleet, and that all were coming towards him. These reports, however, when considered in conjunction with those from the Lion and Champion, were at variance in regard to the position of the enemy. Two more reports, based on direction finding wireless, uh, wireless received from the Admiralty at 5.50pm, uh, uh, no, 5.05pm and 5.33pm, as it happened, were fairly accurate. For some reason, the 5.5, and this gets me every time, I'm not sure if you can see this, there, is written 5.5pm, in it's the old-fashioned way. This book was published in, let's see, published and printed in 1951, so after the Second World War. The A's also differed from the others, Angelica was suspicious of them, partly on account of the erroneous information received from the Admiralty that morning. That is one of the problems in life. If you... If the, for the Admiralty especially, they sent out the wrong information in the morning. They told him that Shear was not at sea, he was da-da-da-da-da, and that had caused problems. So now, any information they send subsequently, they've lost credibility. This is an important thing when you're in the intelligence, uh, intelligence business, because when you give out information you've received and you've discerned too quickly, sometimes, without checking enough, you can end up giving out false information and losing your credibility. This is where a good scouting force and lots of reports from his subordinate battlecruiser commander would have really come in handy. And partly because he considered that directional wireless was not always reliable. Again, backed up by history at this point. Apart from individual discrepancies, a constant and more serious error was the basic difference between the calculated position of the Grand Fleet and that of the Battlecruiser Fleet. As already mentioned, the two forces, having set out from different bases some 17 hours previously, had been subject to different conditions of weather and tide, and furthermore, the Recife Force had been in action for several hours, whereas the Scarborough Force had maintained a steady course for most of that time. It so happened that the Iron Duke, by her own reckoning, was four miles northwest of her true geographical position, and the Lion, by her reckoning, was seven miles east of her actual position. The accumulated error of the two flagships was therefore about 11 miles in an east-southeast direction, and since the Lion had not been sighted by any ships of the battle fleet, no one was yet aware of this large discrepancy. 
The general trend of all the reports as plotted in the Iron Duke led Jellicoe to expect that the enemy battle fleet would be sighted right ahead at about 6.30pm if they held their present course. In other words, he believed them to be six miles farther eastward and about nine miles farther off than they actually were. It came as a shock, therefore, when the cruiser Black Prince, occupying an extreme westerly position on the cruiser screen, reported at 5.42pm that she had sighted the enemy battle cruisers five miles ahead of her. This screen, as previously mentioned, was only six miles ahead of the battle fleet. So the Black Prince's report, if correct, implied that the enemy battle for cruisers were only 11 miles away and well to the westward of Jellicoe. In fact, it placed them 20 miles farther northwest than Southampton's reports had done. This appeared so improbable that the commander in chief correctly assumed that they must be our own battle cruisers. Confirmation came a few minutes later when the Marlborough, leading the starboard wing division of the battle fleet, reported that she could see. Uh, she could. Pages stuck together. See the British battle cruisers on her starboard bow. Jellicoe quickly realised the enemy fleet was much farther to the westward than he'd been led to expect from the wireless reports. At 6 p.m., he sighted Beatty's battle cruisers, about five miles distance, head across the, uh, heading across his bows on easterly course, hotly engaged with an unseen enemy. He asked Lion, "Where is the enemy battle fleet?" But Beatty. Being fully occupied at the moment trying to prevent Hipper from sighting the ground fleet and being unable to see the high seas fleet, could only reply that the enemy battle cruisers whom he was fighting bore southeast. I suppose Jellico at least got a reply. That's an advantage. But again, what's BT's role in this battle? Is BT's role in this battle to fight the battle cruisers, or is his role in this battle to bring the enemy battle fleet? into the teeth of the British battle fleet so they can be annihilated. There is part of me which respects BT a lot as a fighting commander. He is very aggressive and that is something I like in a commanding officer. They need to be. He is seeking out the enemy and he wants to engage them. That is good. But that's also not a senior admiral's role. A senior admiral has to be able to take a step back and think strategically. You could say that BT's fought strategically in picking Seymour, because Seymour had the good connections to help him fight the campaigns in Whitehall and in government. Well, that's lovely, but that's not what you need on the battlefield. In fact, what he could have done honestly, because he's a senior admiral, is he could have appointed two communications officers. He could have taken a second one. No one would have said, uh, shouted and uh, told him off if he'd gone, you know what, I'll take Seymour and let's see, who's the really experienced uh, comms guy we have here? Oh, uh, what's his name? Somerville. Oh, yes, I'll take him and Seymour. They'll be my S. They'll be my crack SS team, Somerville and Seymour, and actually that would have been a fairly good compromise because he could have said, well, one will deal with the communications with the Admiralty, that can be Seymour, and one can deal with the communications with the fleet and with Jellicoe, because one will ensure that the Grand Fleet gets the community comms and a message card, and one will make sure that the Admiralty is getting updated and they can both support me. And that would have been an excellent thing for him to do. That would have been a very sensible thing for him to do. But that would also be admitting he needs, support, he needs help. And he doesn't do that. Jellico, meanwhile, turned the leaders of his battle fleet columns together to starboard in order to make some ground to the west, which brought his divisions into Eklon. Realising from BT's signal that the enemy might come into sight at any moment, instead of in 20 minutes' time as he had calculated, he resumed his original southeasterly course, which brought his column leaders a beam again, and more handy for deploying into line of battle. The visibility was about seven miles, and was appreciably less than gun range. It was therefore a matter of vital importance that the Grand Fleet should be formed in line of battle with all its guns bearing an enemy fleet as soon as it appeared from the mists. On a clear day, this would have presented no great difficulty, but the Commander-in-Chief could see only a curtain of mist and smoke ahead of him. Beattie's battle's cruisers, shrouded in smoke, were still on his starboard bow, crossing from west to east, their gun flashes piercing the murk. Which way should Jellicoe turn? His first inclination was to turn to starboard, westward, as all the signs of battle were in that direction. But this manoeuvre might place him at a serious tactical disadvantage, with his weakest ships in the van. 
impinging um, almost directly on the uh, high seas fleet. He decided therefore to deploy to port and keep between the enemy and their coast. Before committing himself, he still hoped for a report of the enemy's relative position from some British ship which had both fleets in view, for only then could he gauge the exact position of the enemy relative to himself. Fifth Battle Squadron at this moment was suitably placed to give the required information, but no report of any sort had come from them. A signal from Hood on the extreme eastern flank would have helped, but he too was in action and had remained silent. In the words of the official historian, no time was to be lost as the point was to be made in time. Beyond a few miles, everything was shrouded in mist, the li and li the little that could be seen was no more than a blurred picture. Above all this there was the roar of battle, both ahead and to starboard. In this blind distraction, Admiral Jellicoe had to make the decision upon which the fortunes of his country hung. Beatty, meanwhile, had forced Hipper back on Shears' van, and while so uh, doing, sighted the enemy battle fleet. He merely signalled, have sighted enemy battle fleet bearing south-southwest. This vital information reached Jellicoe at 6.14pm and was confirmed a few minutes later by a report from Evan Thomas of 5th Battle Squadron, who, it wasn't really his job. He was supposed to signal to, G uh, to Beatty and Beatty was supposed to signal to, uh, to Jellicoe. That was the chain of command. Evan Thomas had sort of given up on that one by this point. <clears throat> Um, all doubts were now set at rest. Jellicoe ordered the battle fleet to deploy into single line ahead, with the fort wing column leading on a course southeast by east. This manoeuvre brought the ships of the starboard wing column into the rear of the line, and a few minutes later they came into action. Jellicoe in his dispatch states, firing was general in the battle fleet, only three or four ships being in sight at a time from the van and centre, although they were visible from the rear. Ships fired at what they could see when they could see it. It was. It has been said that Beatty could have given Jellicoe some idea of the position of the enemy battle fleet when he first sighted the Iron Duke, but he was at that moment engaged in a fierce combat with Hipper's battle cruisers, and at least an hour had passed since he had last seen the enemy battle fleet. An inaccurate or estimate of their position at that critical moment might have done more harm than good. Some critics have gone so far to suggest that Beatty should not have run out of sight of the High Seas Fleet. If he adopted this course, he would have reached visual touch with Jellicoe much later than he did, and would not have been able to get far enough ahead of Hipper to ride him off. He knew that the 5th Battle Squadron covering his retreat was in touch with the enemy battle fleet and that it had the speed and gunpowder to look after itself. He also knew that Goodenough and his cruisers were providing Commander-in-Chief with a constant flow of comprehensive and accurate reports. He did not and could not uh, know that a combination of ill luck and human error had caused the position of the enemy to be calculated on a basis of some 11 miles to the east of that of, of Commander-in-Chief. In spite of this, however, it was Beatty's brilliant handling of the battle cruisers which gave Jellicoe those few extra minutes required for his deployment. Starters, he didn't know, he knew no such thing about good enough. He was not getting comm signals and he did not know that good enough was doing that. Secondly, at no point does he give orders to um, Evan Thomas to do that role, which apparently Evan Thomas was perfectly situated to do, and Evan Thomas would need orders or would need to feel justified in going around his commander. Finally, and please. Do not consider this me being cruel of Beatty. But this guy goes on with nothing like enough credit has been given to Beatty for his masterly tactics in the critical half hour between it before the two main fleets clashed. By foresight and strong offensive action, he forced Hipper to retire, thus denying the, the German commander in chief the vital information that the British battle fleet was not only uncomfortable close, but was actually deploying into line the battle across his bowels and placed him in a tactical position of great difficulty. Um, apparently the German official history then states that tact uh, that full appreciation of BT's conduct however comes from the enemy who frankly admits that Scheer being placed in a tactically untenable position by an outflanking movement of BT's. Scheer himself says that he had taken he was taken completely by surprise. Suddenly a German fan was faced by the belching guns and telling line of heavy ships extending from northwest to southwest northeast. Well, considering that fleet was the Grand Fleet, and that was Jellicoe's decision in the nicest way, I can't, I don't really uh, say I think you can give that to Beatty, especially as Beatty was fleeing north, and by your own information, he doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't have accurate information on where the British fleet is. So, um, yeah. The point I'm making, and the point you have to think about when you're talking about this book, and when you're going through the information of that, is you have to rate it properly. I would argue Beatty's aggression had allowed him to fight, ha had helped him fight the enemy and did help him keep his fighting forces together. And at certain points in his career, it's excellent. The point is, though, 
he had been promoted through to Admiral based on his elan, his dash, his aggression. And the thing is, for his role, he needed someone who you needed someone who could take a step back. And BT can never do this. BT doesn't think strategically. He's dashing. He doesn't think strategically. So that's a fair analysis because this is a very pro BT book. But the thing is, even the pro points you can read through and go, but whose role is it to do this? This is the that's the first question you have to ask. Is it good enough's role to keep sending Jellico information? Well, no. Good enough is supposed to be transmitting to BT. Good enough is the person who works with BT more than anyone else, and he gives up before Thomas does. Thomas is working has basically gone. You are supposed to be my senior officer. Supposed to be my senior officer. By this point, I am transmitting directly to Jellico because I no longer have the faith that you actually know anything's going on. Which is great for Jellico, but that actually and complicates the scenario for Jellico even more. Here is this dirty little secret about Jellico, and the thing that knocks me most about it. You only require BT to have one staff officer sending off regular transmissions, wide area, so that no one knows whether they're going to Admiralty or going to Jellico, but loud enough that Jellico can pick them up. Detail giving their position and what they are fighting, giving their position and engagement. That will not reveal their position, uh, the position of the ground fleet to the enemy, and will provide Jellico with the information to hone in far, far more quickly. You need one staff officer to be sending those radio and transmissions off. Because you're communicating with much of your fleet by flag signals, you are sending them occasional radio messages, but if that staff officer is sending off a radio message every 20 minutes, that's not going to take a lot of time because it's basically position, engaging enemy battlecruiser forces, presumed battle fleet behind them. Engaging, uh, did that a position, engage, and yes, it might be out, it might not be always accurate, but it will guide the fleet in a lot quicker. And... Jellico will probably keep at a higher speed for longer, which means Jutland takes place earlier, which is useful. And who doesn't pick those staff officers? That stops with the Admiral who man creates the staff, and that is BT. So, I hope you enjoy. Thank you for watching. You will find a link to hopefully the Amazon buying, because there is supposed to be a newer version of this book of out and available down below if you're interested in it. And I said it is worth reading because it is a very well written account. It is pro BT, but there is nothing wrong with reading a pro BT account or a pro or an anti BT account. What's worthwhile is reading it and thinking, what's the fair point? Because if you read an anti-BT account, and I do not point anything he does which is good, and I do not say he has any redeeming features, then they are wrong, because he's human. Of course he has some. There are a couple of exceptions to that rule, but they're very rare. I don't rate him in the position he ends up in. I don't think he was suitable for the role. I think he campaigns and takes that position and then gets higher. But I don't think he should have been in those positions because I don't think he was that capable on the strategic side. Because the strategic side requires you take a step back. And BT at no point ever seems to have been able to take that step back. He would have been a very good rear admiral. And that would have been the post I would have taken him to. Give him a single squadron. Let him run around them, and that would be the point to which, thank you. You have served your nation well. Retire with honour. Maybe join the House of Commons, or the House of Lords, whichever one's easiest. And then he could have been useful there. Because he had passion, and he had good PR, 
And if someone else was making the strategic decisions, he'd have been very, very helpful. Anyway, that's enough. Take care. Hope you enjoyed this.